Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Chess Books Recaptured. We are rejoined today by a friend of the pod. He was an adult improver guest a couple years back. He's well known in the online chess community as knows knows all, a uh, frequent contributor to the chess dojo and uh, creating Lee Chess studies and very active in the Lee Chess community. He's also a fast improving chess lover and chess bibliophile. Um, huge fan of one of the books we will be discussing. Uh, today in particular, away from the board, he is a CFD software engineer. He told me what the CFD means, but I already forgot. Um, and he is based more recently in Austin, Texas. And since we last spoke, um, finished his PhD. So congratulations and welcome to Dr. Knows Knows All. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Dr. Knows is a great moniker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if we had video last time. This time, of course, we're on YouTube as well. Um, so it's it's nice to be able to look at each other while we chat. So the two books we're going to discuss are Strategic Exercise, Chess Exercises by Grandmaster Emmanuel Bricard and Think Like a Super GM by Michael Adams, Grandmaster and Philip Hurtado. Before we go any further, there was a guy who yelled at me on YouTube saying, when you do these book discussions, you need to immediately say what level the books are for. So <laughs> shout, shout out to the person who harangued me. I'm going to do you a solid at least this one time and tell you that these are both intermediate level books. I would say not greatly suited for anyone below 1500. I would say Think Like a Super GM is slightly more accessible. Um, and we'll be going into that. And of course, we'll have timestamps for the, the discussions of each book. But before we zoom out a little bit, Michael, do you agree with those uh, estimates? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely put the Bricard book as a bit harder. Um, to me, Think Like a Super GM has some aspects that are like applicable to anyone, like anyone, even a thousand rated could read it and actually get something from it. But the core of the book uh, solving the exercises. Yeah, completely agree. 1500 plus is a, is a pretty reasonable estimate. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad we're on the same page there. And so the way that this one came about, of course, I've exchanged emails and chatted with Michael over the years, and he really wanted to discuss strategic chess exercises in particular. And since we both agree that it's less well known than Think Like a Super GM, for example, I interviewed Grandmaster Michael Adams about Think Like a Super GM. I know that uh, Jesse Cry interview, uh, reviewed it for the Chess Dojo. So because that one has already gotten a little more shine, we're going to start with strategic ex chess exercises. And Michael, Michael, so we might as well start with what it is about this book that made you uh, so eager to discuss it. So just as a little bit of background, um, the book itself is 90 exercises. Uh, 60, I believe, are in the middle game. 30 are in the uh, end game. And they're set up as white to move, black to move, and maybe one sentence, like uh, what are the weaknesses in this position or which piece of yours should you seek to improve? Some basic sort of not necessarily that useful uh, question. And what I really like about the book is that it cuts to like the core of what it takes to actually improve. It, it really focuses on what specific moves you need to make to improve your position and how to evaluate a position and focus in on like the key factor that you need to actually work on through these 90 exercises. And then in the solutions to each of these exercises, it both starts with the solution to the actual exercise, but then kind of uh, transitions into a full annotated uh, analysis of the rest of the game. And these are all from famous players from Steinitz, uh, Korchnoi, I think there's a Kasparov game in there, like for a hundred years of interesting grandmasters. And you get basically the GM level annotations of interesting games that are not necessarily well known. and a bunch of very interesting highlighted positions that you can kind of improve your chess on. Yeah, a unique format that I really enjoy. There are a few other books like it, which we will get into just to give uh, listeners a few more bare facts about the book. It's for, published in 2018 from New in Chess. It's also available on Chessable. Shout out to Chessable, by the way. And it's reasonably inexpensive on Chessable. I think it's like uh, 25 bucks. You can also get it on Kindle. Um, for even cheaper. Uh, the author, oh, and there you have it, the actual uh, paper book. I realized I try to get paper books for when, for when we're doing video just so I can hold it up, but I actually didn't for this one. I only have it on Kindle. But uh, Emmanuel Bricard was the 1993 French national chess champion. He is a trainer. And in the, the as we'll discuss, the, the 
the prose is fairly sparse, especially in terms of like any context. Um, but he does say that basically this is the compilation of uh, 15 years worth of teaching material in the intro. And I, I would definitely say that it shows. Yeah, the the thing that really shines about um, what he just mentioned there is that truly out of the 15 years, these are definitely like the best examples because I can tell every single time you go to a next exercise, it it really, maybe not while you're solving it, but after the fact, when you've seen the answer and you're really reviewing it, it's it's almost like this is the perfect example for each of the different things that he's trying to show. And nothing is sorted at all. But like after the fact, when you kind of look back on the position and you have that like uh, knowledge and insight from a grandmaster, you can be like, oh yeah, like of course, like I should be looking for this type of an idea in this type of a position. And this was like the perfect example <laughs> to yeah. show that. Yeah, I, I agree. And even though it's a lot of, um, you know, world champion players and legendary players, it wasn't one of those books where I felt like I've seen all these puzzles before. Um, no. And I know you're you're very well read in your own right. Did you have that experience as well, Michael? Yeah, I mean, out of the 90 games, I believe I recognized maybe one or two uh, as like there was a Fisher game that I noticed. And that's about it, honestly. <laughs> a Geller game, I think, also. Yeah, super impressive in that regard. And also in terms of like engine checking, I mean, of course, we go back and forth on like how much does it matter if you're trying to illustrate an idea, a way to think at the board, whether the move is accurate or not. But I, we had emailed a little bit because I was looking at the book on Kindle and you made a Lee Chess study. Uh, so you, you it was very easy once you've done that for you to engine check everything. And and yeah, I mean, it's it seems super accurate, which it's already a few years since the book was published. So it's pretty impressive in that regard, too. Yeah, definitely used an engine in 2018 for sure. Um, and there's some very, very small quibble with like a few, not even like the main part of the solution, but like a few of the annotations a little bit deeper. Uh, but honestly, no, it's it's very, very correct, if you will. Uh, engine correct, that is. <laughs> yeah. So what what brought you to this book, Michael? How did you even hear about it? this, uh, this hidden gem? I want to say... Um, International master Andras Top might have made uh, a small mention of this book at some point in like his list of good books. Um, I don't, I don't think it's really talked about by anyone. But this, it's just, yeah. I mean, maybe I'll repeat myself one more time. I feel like the positions were just so well chosen, and they're both challenging but also not inaccessible. That it kind of makes it like it cuts deeply into this is what it takes to actually improve is like really understanding these positions, being able to evaluate them correctly and being able to find the correct plan or move or something like that is, um, I really genuinely feel like I improved a lot uh, by going through this book. Nice. And yeah, and for context, uh, some listeners will already be familiar with Michael, but you're you're like over 2000 Lee Chesses now, right? What, what are your ratings? I can't even keep up. They go up so fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, 1911 USCF. Um, and I believe I was about 1700 when I was going through the book. Um, so 200 points <laughs> in the intervening uh, time. And then also I was, um, I'm now pushing 2500 uh, Lee Chess Rapid, which is pretty good. Yeah, that that's amazing progress. And I know you don't get to play as much uh, OTB as you like. I heard your interview on uh, Chess Journeys with uh, Kevin Skull, where, where you said you gain 50 points basically every USCF tournament you play. It's just you don't play that often. And all I can say in response, Michael, is it must be nice. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, yeah, it does feel a little gratifying every time that I get a chance to, to show off a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, so this is a puzzle book, as is Think Like a Super GM. So there's there's not a, a ton we can say about it, but um, but there are a few more. For example, I have some quibbles um, about it, but are there any other points you'd want to highlight before we get to my personal nitpicking of a book that I greatly enjoyed as well, to be clear? Um, yeah, I mean, the the main... Well, before I get to any like negatives about it, the main the main positives I, I've mostly mentioned. Um, I would also like to say though that because they're all taken from uh, not necessarily famous grandmaster games, but games from famous grandmasters, um, the interesting annotations sometimes uh, will devolve, and he'll say, you know, 
at some point I looked at this with some course uh, or some some students and we got interested in about this king and pawn end game. So you're in some random example about some random grandmaster game and maybe five to 10 moves into that grandmaster game. He's like, oh, and by the way, here's a really interesting king and pawn end game that can arrive. And then it's a whole bunch of analysis about this king and pawn end game that you can either completely skip or really dig deep into. And sometimes it's fascinating <laughs> and sometimes you just don't have the bandwidth to keep up. And because it's presented as like, this is an aside, you can choose to, you know, dig it deeper or ignore it. So it's kind of fun. It's, it's definitely, it's presented as 90 exercises, but there's so much more in the solutions than just those 90 positions that it's, um, you get, you get what you put in. Yeah, I mean, you're really getting close to 90 games. There are a couple of times where he does a cliffhanger, <laughs> give you a position from one, like an earlier position from a game. And then when you go to the answer, he tells you, and we're going to pick up this with another puzzle from the game, you know, go go to number X. So it's yeah. it's not quite 90 games. But as I said, when I interviewed Grandmaster Vochik Miranda, both of his uh, recent books, I think, are similar in spirit. I told him that I thought that his book is like, a, it's like a game collection in disguise because it's presented as a puzzle book, but really um, the games are fully analyzed in great detail. Um, and I think that's a great format for learning a lot because it's great to get these little puzzles, but it's much more helpful when you can see the full uh, ideas in action. Yeah. And you can kind of see the conclusion of, oh, this achieved good control over the D file and you no longer can challenge the D file, for instance. But then actually seeing how the game progresses, you can understand how that can then translate into something more than just you have a D file. Yeah. So greatly instructive. The end game and middle game stuff are um are both good. And it's primarily what we would call positional puzzles, better place, you know, where to put your pieces, how to take advantage of whatever weakness within your enemy's camp. But one thing about this book is it's very concrete. Um, so a lot of meaning a lot of variations. And um, he really tries to account for every move in practically every position. So there's calculation involved in terms of the, the positional puzzles, but there also are some tactics in there as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one thing that's uh, worth mentioning, uh, uh, like we kind of said at the beginning, but it's not an easy book, right? So if you're 1700 over the board, or maybe 1600 over the board or somewhere around there, it's like the minimum to really dig deep into these. Uh, I can tell you that it sort of starts easier and sort of ends harder, although there's no... Uh, clear delineation between them. Um, but at 17 to 1800 USCF, I was maybe getting 75% correct near the beginning of the book and clearly less than 50% uh, near the end of the book. So it is quite challenging and does require focus, calculation, et cetera, as well as the underlying uh, positional understanding. So it's definitely not a good first <laughs> strategy book at all. Yeah, I agree. This is not not a book you want to do for ego gratification. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is quite challenging, but um, extremely informative. Um, so I do have a couple quibbles with the book, but is it time yet? I mean, because again, a lot of my notes, and this happens sometimes when you're t doing a puzzle book, is I, I do have notes that'll be like, wow, you know, or that was very instructive. But since this is an audio only podcast, you, uh, listen, we, we just encourage listeners to take our word on that <laughs> on that front. But I do have, um, like I said, a, a few quibbles as well. Yeah, go for it. OK, I mean, mainly it's just with the way the questions are framed. Um, and this book, I believe, was translated from French. So that may have something to do with it. But as you say, um, there's very it's very sparse in the way the puzzles are presented. And I like when they don't give you a theme. So it's not that it's not that particular issue. It's more just the actual phrasing. Like he'll have a position where he says, which move leads to a large advantage, comma, a win, I'd say. And it just seems like, you know, you're he's sitting there with an engine, presumably, like you can tell us if it's if it's a win or not. So it just seems this very sort of strange formulation. And sometimes he's kind of leading the witness a little bit with his questions as well, um, which they're hard puzzles. So on the one hand, I appreciate it. But on the other, it doesn't seem fully uh, in the spirit of, of the book. Um, how What do you think of those critiques? I, I actually agree. I thought the questions themselves were not necessarily helpful. But uh, one of the benefits of kind of setting up the positions in my Leach study when I was solving this is I was solving it with a friend and uh, we would just hide the question. We wrote the question and we would just hide it. 
Right. So we'd start solving the position by ourselves, just kind of like knowing after a few and doing a few of them kind of what we're looking for. And then after maybe five to 10 minutes, if we weren't getting anywhere, then we would reveal his question, which sometimes wouldn't help at all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's useful in that it kind of gives you a little bit of guidance, but it's definitely not like, I mean, there are no themes and there's no structure. So you're kind of thrown in the deep end each and every time. Yeah. And there are also some cases where like in one puzzle, he asks like uh, such and such move is connected to what plan? And then you go to the answer and it's just variations. You know, there's no real discussion of, of a plan. So if you really concentrate um, as you should be and go through it, you can kind of discern the plan. But right. I think a lot of people who've read books like Jeremy Silman's um, or Simple Chess are are kind of used to a plan being um, explained in, in very concrete or very um, meticulous detail. And in this one, he kind of sets you up for that, but then doesn't actually explain it. So, I mean, I would, you know, I'm big fan of this book. Definitely recommend it. As Michael said, big caveat that it is for a certain audience. Like if you're related, if you're rated below 1600 USCF, it's probably not the best choice. I mean, of course, you could still get something out of it. Um, but I am a big fan of the book, but there, I did have quibbles both to the questions, especially, but also a little bit about sometimes they didn't exactly answer the question that was given, which I guess is somewhat connected. Yeah, a little bit like he added the question after the fact, just to maybe provide a little bit of context. Yeah, um, I, I would agree definitely with uh, what you're saying about the solutions. However, I feel like he will say it in very few words. He's very succinct, right? So when he's explaining, oh, you're going to do a minority attack and therefore, like you could continue that sentence and therefore we're going to create a weakness on the queen side that we can then attack with our heavy pieces, right? You could actually fully finish that sentence and give some explanation, but instead he'll say something like a five starting the minority attack and then move on. And that's like the answer to the plan that you were going, like, it's not actually fully written out for you. So I definitely hear what you're saying. And I also agree that like you can figure it out, but he's not, he's not going to hold your hand. Definitely. Yeah. And of course, in any puzzle book, I mean, this is especially true with tactics book, like famously with endgame studies, people say, you know, start by looking for the most ridiculous move, you know, <laughs> and there, there's a good chance that you'll find it. And so with positional puzzles, that's less true. But there is an example where like, you know, you have to recapture a piece in the center and you could either take one way that gives you like double isolated pawns or you could take with a piece and leave your pawn structure intact. And it's hard not when you're presented with a puzzle like that to, to think, well, this is a puzzle book. So if it were just to take with the piece, like this wouldn't be in here. Um, but that's, you know, that's going to happen in in any book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had less issue with some of the weird solutions because especially when you like turn on the engine after the fact, it's like clearly correct, you know? Yeah. So then <laughs> in yeah. some sense, there's just like, oh, well, this is uh, one of those counter examples that's worth really knowing, even though uh, you're right, like maybe your first reaction, what the hand would move is not going to be uh, the final solution there. <laughs> yeah, but incredibly accurate analysis from from as far as I could tell. Um, yeah. So I think we should come back to this book after we discuss Think Like a Super GM because so, we can compare them a little bit. But anything to add before we hop over to another great recent book? Yeah, just um, continuing the thought process from earlier. Um, these are annotated games at the end of the day. And it's really cool how you get to track. There's a little bit of chess history involved in this. So you get to really see some of those top players that were not necessarily the world champion that you've seen their games of, right? The Gellers of the world, the Korsnoys of the world. Um, there's a bunch of players that were like in the top 10 uh, that were not necessarily number one. So it's really uh, a little bit of chess history as well, although he doesn't talk too much about the surroundings of each of the games, but it's really cool just to see kind of how these concepts developed throughout the ages, because you'll see some ideas that are very commonplace now that uh, maybe this was like the first example in the 50s that someone actually put together. So it's very yeah. cool. Yeah, well said. Definitely strong recommend of the book, despite my quibbles. And we will uh, return to it after we discuss Think Like a Super GM. So, uh, Michael, did you read Think Like a Super? Which book did you read first? 
So I read them in pretty similar time frame. Um, strategic chess exercises is one of the ones that I started with in maybe 2022. And then uh, Think Like a Super GM, I finished at the beginning of this year. So similar time frames. Okay. And again, I would encourage listeners to listen to my interview with Michael Adams, where we discuss the book some. I may interview uh, their, the co-author, Philip Hurtado, someday. Um, according to the book, the book was primarily Philip Hurtado's brainchild. He's a 1900-level club player who describes himself as an engineer, physicist, statistician, and passionate amateur chess player. And funny enough, Michael, we were discussing before we record, he has sort of like a rocket science type background and ended up working in uh, automotive engineering, which is also, correct me if I'm wrong, the field that you're uh, now working in. Yeah, exactly. I was modeling uh, the fluid dynamics around uh, aerospace stuff and, and the hypersonics, et cetera. And then now I'm working on uh, modeling the aerodynamics around new potential card models. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, very similar trajectory. Yeah, which, is, which is pretty funny. And you can see the science background that Philip has because he's sort of compelled by the question of what separates the thinking of super GMs um, or even grandmasters uh, from uh, regular amateur players. Uh, and for those not familiar with the format of the book, it's pretty unique. It's inspired by uh, De Groot's Thought and Choice in Chess, which is a famous study uh, conducted around the 1938 Avro, one of these famous international tournaments where a bunch of the best players in the world were there. And they were able to pull them aside and show them different chess positions and sort of just write about what it is that they observed and compare it to what sort of more am more casual chess players uh, observed about the positions. And there've been a couple other books in this vein along the years, but it's a great format. And this one is very well executed because I mean, they've got, I forgot to check the number, but something like 12 or 13 players across the rating spectrum, ranging from uh, Super GM Mickey Adams, many time uh, British champion, all the way down to like an 1100 rated 10 year old. Um, so it's really fascinating to see how each player and they give the thoughts of different players on all of these puzzle positions. That's 40 puzzle positions plus bonus positions. Yeah, um, the 40 main positions, uh, I would say about 30 of them were chosen by, by Philip. Um, and that means that they were just taken from his online blitz games, usually because uh, I don't think he's playing too much over the board. And then uh, 10 of them, I think, were chosen by Mickey Adams. And that usually came from like a Mickey Adams OTP uh, <laughs> famous game against Anand or famous game against, you know, Polgar or someone. Um, so there's uh, a very interesting <laughs> selection of those uh, as well. And then the eight bonus ones, um, they're not necessarily bad puzzles. In fact, I actually liked them quite a bit, uh, but there's not necessarily one correct solution. So if you look at things with the engine turned on, then you'll see that maybe there's a few moves that are going to be 0.0, .0 or plus 0.9 or something. So those eight are just as interesting, but then don't technically qualify according to whatever measure or yardstick they were using to, to figure out um, kind of what it takes to be a super GM. And then finally, there's also a uh, eye tracker experiment at the back of the book uh, as a bit of a sideshow at the end. Um, and that also has like maybe six different... Uh, positions that you can kind of analyze also with full solutions as well. Yeah, we should probably return to the uh, eye tracker, um, as you say, sideshow in a little bit, just a, a couple other details to add. Um, one other thing that differentiates this book is they ask you not just for uh, what you think the best move is and a sequence, but for you to provide an evaluation at the end of your line, um, which I find to be quite helpful because this is something that came up in uh, one of my interviews with Matthew Sadler and, of course, uh, FM Nate Solon and Eugene Perlstein have subsequently written um, Evaluate Like a Grandmaster, where you try to work on this skill. And since it's become a bigger part of my consciousness, I've realized more when playing OTP that you do have these positions where, you know, you're you're looking at some sequence, but then you reach the end. And if especially if there's a material imbalance, you're like, you you don't know how you're doing at the end of it. So it kind of makes it hard to determine if you should go into the line if you can't determine um, how you're doing in that position. So I do think that that's a, a skill worth practicing and it's nice that they highlight it uh, within this book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I also read that same book that you're mentioning by Eugene Perlstein. And I also agree that that's kind of become part of my uh, psyche, if you will. So every time I'm like working through these positions at the end with maybe someone else in a voice chat, uh, we'll kind of come up with our solutions 
or maybe just the first move. And then we'll say things like, and yeah, white is probably better. Let's say maybe plus one, maybe plus 1.5, somewhere around there kind of thing. So it's like part of the answer is not just giving the move uh, or giving the plan or giving the idea, but like you have to actually give an evaluation and stand by it. And then at the end of the day, we'll actually turn on the engine, <laughs> see who's more right. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's it's a skill well worth practicing. One other thing to note, uh, just in terms of where you can get, uh, think like a super GM, um, I believe it is only in book form. And of course, it's on the the app forward chest, which is a really nice way to to study it. Um, did which which format did you use? Or did you use a physical board, Michael? Um, so I uh, also created a study, um, but basically got the physical book and then started putting the positions into a physical, uh, a lead chest study <laughs> to, to actually solve the problems. Okay. So you're doing it digitally? Yeah. So when I was actually like looking at the board and kind of like working through the positions, I was looking at my computer screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And another differentiating factor between these books, um, again, I would say this one is slightly more accessible. Um, it's been a while since I've gone through all the puzzles, but my recollection is it's not so much that the puzzles are easier, although maybe there's a few that are easier. But again, it, it comes back to where we were saying about there just being more explanations. Did you find the puzzles to be easier as well, Michael? Um, well, I had did the book second. <laughs> so in some sense, I had all the uh, the beefy chess understanding I picked up from Picard's book when I was working on it. Um, but yeah, I would say in general, um, well, actually, I won't, I won't give a spoiler alert to, to what I actually scored, but um, I did much better on this book uh, overall. And I also completely agree with what you're saying, where um, they kind of asked Mickey Adams to really go full explanation fully explain every single part of the position. So as opposed to maybe what he would say when he was solving the problem, the actual solution itself definitely says, okay, and you can talk about the bishop pair, you can talk about the double pawns, you can talk about king safety, and he does kind of like fully explore all those aspects, and that's part of the evaluation. So yeah. it's definitely, it's more hand-holding because I believe they're trying to get a, a broader audience. Yeah. And you mentioning getting a score that that reminds me that that is another feature of this book. They have the like semi gamified um, sort of um, format where you get a score on each individual puzzle. And at the end, you can add up your score and convert it um, into a, a rough rating estimate. And as I told Michael Adams, when when we discussed the book, when it came out, that totally sucked me in because I, while I always read the books of, uh, especially new books of um, any guests that I interview, if there's a lot of chess puzzles, I often don't have time to go through them. But I was so drawn in by the gamification that, that their system worked. There you go. It's every time. <laughs> the chess of all of uh, book form. Yeah, exactly. But it, it's um really well done. And um, Jesse Cry has a short uh, video review of Think Like a Super GM on the Chess Dojo um, channel. And he mentioned that one thing that he really appreciates about the book is as a air quotes, run of the mill grandmaster. Sorry, Jesse, I'd love to be a run of the mill grandmaster. Um, compared to a super GM like Michael Adams, he says he doesn't really care about what the engine says the best move is because he can't learn from that. But he said he loved to see the thought process of, of a super GM comparing to himself. And obviously, since they um, have uh, the thoughts of people across the rating spectrum, that's true for, for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely the main selling point of the book, in my opinion, as well. Um, just being able to kind of figure out where you're at by comparing your thoughts to those thoughts of the 1100, the 1700, the 2000, the 2500. You can really get a barometer that tells you, um, oh, you're just way off on this type of a position. Because maybe, let's say you're an E4 player and this position came from a D4, D5 opening and you just have no clue. <laughs> right. So, Sometimes you can really uh, come up with a reason why you wouldn't get this one, um, but it still helps to, to figure those out because, you know, all openings can kind of transpose into each other. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely uh, nice to really place yourself in this uh, food chain, if you will. Yeah. And it's nice that they, at the end, they kind of tie everything together, which some chess books are not great at doing. They kind of take a step back and look at, so what was it that differentiated the thinking of a super grandmaster from different players across the rating spectrum? Um, and I think we should spoil their conclusions, don't you, Michael? I mean, we don't have to keep them secret, do we? That's not the true value of the book. Well, it's kind of funny because some of the main conclusions that they have are also the most obvious things that anyone would be able to come up with if you were just guessing. <laughs> so in some sense, there's nothing secret. It's uh, 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. So bef before we get to the conclusion, I do want to share a, a quote from Hurtado. And again, I give this book an A plus. I love it. I actually wrote a review about of it uh, that I'll also link to um, when it came out. But um, but Hurtado writes in the intro. More than 80 years after de Groot's first experiment, I revisited his methodology aided by Stockfish, a chess engine of superhuman ability, and Minitab, an advanced statistical software tool using new previously unpublished chess puzzles. I've tried to finally uncover the exact differences between players of varying strengths. As I write this introduction now in my apartment in Birmingham, having already conducted the full statistical analysis on the results of, from all the puzzles, I'm excited to announce that that the information I'm about to disclose in this book will be of groundbreaking significance. It may forever change the way you think about top grandmasters and the way they choose their next move. Never before in the history of chess has anyone been able to unravel the mysteries behind the think pro thinking processes of a super grandmaster and accurately determine the differences between their chess thinking and ours. So when I read that, I was thinking, all right, pump the brakes a little there, Philip. Like, you know, it's a great book, but let's not get carried away. <laughs> what, well, what did you think? You let, let me uh, let me finish that with now one of these sentences from the conclusion, if I may. Okay. <laughs> so he says, now, after you've solved all the 40 problems and kind of talked through the solutions and read what Mickey Adams had to think while he was solving it, what Mickey Adams had to think with the engine as well, um, this is one of the conclusions. He says, uh, working with players above 2300 ELO, I couldn't fail to notice how concrete they were when they were giving out their variations. A weak player will enumerate multiple possibilities and give you an abstract idea of what they're aiming to do but rarely define precise lines. Meanwhile, a top grandmaster's variations will quickly converge to one line of play, which often tends to be the best line given by the computer. Mm -hmm. So it's like also, it's so obvious. Of course, that's the case. Yes, they're better at chess, <laughs> but it's also, um, it's not necessarily practically useful. Yeah, so yeah, so I did want to throw in that mild critique, but uh, overall quite useful. And to to spoil the rest of their conclusions, so you can skip ahead a minute or two if you don't want to hear that, although really I don't think it detracts from uh, the reading experience or value of the book at all. Uh, so conclusions, GM spot the best moves faster. They calculate more. Uh, but then they did have the insight that I appreciated that they constantly look to falsify. Uh, club players look for responses that confirm their choices, whereas uh, grandmasters and super grandmasters, um, when they look at moves, they're also they're trying to prove them wrong. Um, yeah. And I, as a scientist, I'm sure you appreciated that, Michael. Yeah, it's really it's it's kind of just using the scientific method, but on the chessboard, right? So like when you come up with a new hypothesis of why something's working, you, you don't say, okay, and I just want evidence that shows that this is correct. The reason you came up with the hypothesis is because you've probably already seen a little bit of evidence that says this is correct. What you're looking for is to prove it wrong. If you can prove it wrong, then you actually have some real concrete understanding that this hypothesis is incorrect and therefore you actually understand the situation better. So yeah, the falsification process is uh, a lot of the grandmasters were doing it and it is a very scientific way to, to analyze. Yeah, and I was listening to your recent interview with uh, Kevin Skull and he actually mentioned, and it's funny because I had just reviewed this material and he actually mentioned that exact thing where he has a tendency when he, he said, he's, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he said when he sees a move, he's inclined to automatically think it's good, you know, and, you know, if see the good in the move rather than look for the bad in it. And I, I've, I've observed and experienced as well this, this tendency. Um, so that is something where like that nugget of information, you know, you can work on your thinking process and apply it to your games where to your other point, like obviously when we look, when we find what we believe to be the best move, and then we look for what we believe to be the best response, um, that awareness is not going to make us better at spotting the best response. Like that's still a big part of the skill gap between a grandmaster and a regular player. But I think the mere the mere fact of looking for the best response, being very conscious of it, I do think could be helpful for a lot of players. True, true. So it's like the platitude itself is kind of obvious, but right. yet by just remembering that it's so obvious that you need to give it some credence, you can then hopefully fix your thought process a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you had a couple other quibbles with this book, right, uh, Michael? So yeah, the the um, minor quibbles about the conclusions kind of being obvious is 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 funny, but but also not a problem. Um, I would say uh, my main quibble with the book is it's it's a little bit of a feel good book because they give you a lot of 
people from all these different rating ranges and they say, look, this person got the answer and he was 1700. But then when you're reading the thought process, like that player was completely wrong about like what was going on. And yet they kind of got the evaluation correct and they kind of got the first move correct. So therefore you get full points according to like this gamification system that they created for the book. And that kind of uh, carried through when I was solving it also. And so at the end of the day, now I can kind of reveal my performance. Um, <laughs> it, it said that I scored, uh, I got a 68 out of 100 in terms of all of the points total that you could possibly get for everything, which says that I'm supposed to be 2247 feet a plus or minus 150. Okay, okay. so <laughs> I'm not I'm not at all a 2250 player though. Like, so it's, it's definitely like a feel good kind of uh, approach to things because I might've gotten the first move right and I might've been reasonably correct on my eval. But if you actually look at what I was thinking, I was going to head completely in the wrong direction to move to. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's, it's yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, my main issue with the book. Yeah, I got the same score and, and did raise the same critique, by the way. I mean, I think it's just an inherent limitation of when you're trying to, it's a blunt instrument when you're trying to have a scoring system like this. You know, there's only so much you can do. Um, right. So it it's certainly adds to the appeal of the book, the fact that it's gamified, but we do have to know going in, it's not going to be uh, super accurate. And, um, you know, I, I was once rated 2250 feet, and now it's like 1900. Um, but I think more realistically, before the past two years, all this deflation, whatever, you know, I'm probably 2050 to, to 2100 feet a strength, at least uh, historically. Um, that's what I felt, but much bigger feather in my cap in my mind when I get a puzzle right that Mickey Adams got wrong, which happened, like, that's something I can, like, take to my grave, you know, whereas, like, <laughs> what, whatever number they're going to assign me, it's kind of like, who cares, you know? Right, right, yeah. And there's also something to be said for, um, we're solving it over the course of, I don't know, it took me more than a month to go through this whole book and to read every once and to put it on the when I reach a study kind of thing and all this stuff. Um, I don't know the conditions that the solvers were actually working under, but I imagine they weren't, you know, coming back to the office for a month to go solve some white chest puzzles. Right. So probably, you know, I had more time and effort uh, than these these people did. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so are we ready to compare the books? Any other points about uh, Think Like a Super GM in particular, Michael? Um, I will also say uh, one of the specific conclusions that um, Think Like a Super GM highlights is also a conclusion that I myself basically simultaneously or maybe a few months before came up with uh, while going through the other book. So maybe this is a good segue uh, into <laughs> comparing them. Um, as you get better at chess, the better you are, the more concrete you are, and the better you are, the more you're willing to calculate the lines that you kind of are trying to figure out. And it's never okay to say, oh, I have this really cool idea or this good idea, and it's a positional idea, but then you don't actually calculate the specific ramifications of that specific line, because then it could just completely fall flat. So definitely the stronger players in Think Like a Super GM were constantly calculating and trying to refute, as we mentioned, and really working hard. Um, and the weaker players were not trying to calculate, you know, as much. Um, but it's also something that you could say about uh, Brickhard's book as well. When you're really trying to find the correct plan, sometimes it requires one extra move that improves the position before you implement the quote unquote plan, because you actually are calculating, well, if I tried to do that first, it falls flat. So you kind of see that in both books that really you just... Chess is a lot of calculation. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And the, the stronger the player they are, the more there is. And in my recent interview with uh, GM Gregory Kaidanov, he actually gave a name to that phenomenon. Uh, he called it non-forcing calculation, which I had never heard before and re really resonated because that is something I've noticed in, in my interactions with stronger players. Um, that they are much more effective of doing. I often think of in my first interview with the aforementioned Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, he talked about training with Dorfman, who, of course, a uh, legendary Soviet trainer who worked with Kasparov, among many others. And he said that when this was when he got the Sanford Fellowship, which is a fellowship for young professional track uh, American players, he 
he was able to finally go get training from an elite trainer like this. And he described what he called the bulldozer method, which was basically uh, where they give you these opening positions and you're just supposed to calculate as far as you possibly can. And it's not like a super concrete, you know, uh, white to move and win material. It's just like, you know, move 12 of the Shvenigen or whatever and just write down every permutation for as far as you can see sort of thing. Um, and that is yeah. the kind of thing that, you know, it's hard. It's extremely hard work. And as Kaidanov said in our interview, it's very hard to make yourself practice if you're not a professional chess player. Um, but when when the rubber meets the mo road, excuse me, in competitive chess, it's something that uh, stronger players do much more naturally and uh, facilely than uh, weaker players do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good uh explanation of like what it takes to get better. It's just sometimes it's a lot of hard work and a lot of really focusing on uh, this fundamental mechanic in chess, which is just calculation. Yeah. <laughs> and both books kind of do highlight that, even though for the vast majority of the problems, um, they're not um, they're not necessarily like a tactical position. There's still tactics everywhere. Yeah. But as you say, um, the way it's dressed up, think like a super jam. I, I agree with you that it's a feel good book in that regard. Um, yeah. So in terms of comparing them, um, what would you say if someone say, say someone 1800 is trying to uh, decide between the two or at least decide which one to do first? What would you advise them? Well, the problem selection in strategic chess exercises, I think, is better, um, but it's not fair to compare them just based on the exercises because the selling point of think like a super GM isn't here's, you know, a million different positional exercises that you can go work on. It's really, here's the thought process of a bunch of different people. Um, so if you really are trying to like hardcore improve your chess, I would probably say Ricard is going to be uh, more bang for your buck. If you really just spend the necessary time to really, you know, I don't want to call it the bulldozer method, but uh, to really bulldoze your way through those problems, um, that's probably going to be more helpful um, because the conclusions that think like a super GM are also going to be things you probably are already aware of. For instance, hey, you got to go calculate. <laughs> that's kind of important. Yeah. And hearing you mention that, it makes me think of two other differences we should note between the books. As you mentioned, I agree, by the way, that the puzzles are better curated in strategic chess exercises. Uh, there's also, uh, think like a super jam is far from only tactics, but I would say more of the tactics are of a uh, tactical, I mean, more of the puzzles, excuse me, are of a tactical orientation. The other, th the other thing, and this kind of speaks to sort of the broader theme that think like a super GM is very thoughtfully presented, you know, a lot of bells and whistles. So they also give you the degree of difficulty with each puzzle, um, which certainly makes it kind of more pleasant to go through because then, if, especially if you're lower rated, you can say, okay, I'm going to get this book and I'm only going to do five and under, you know, for now. And then maybe if I get stronger in a couple of years, I can come back to it and do the higher degree of difficulty. Um, whereas strategic exercise, chess exercises doesn't do that. Um, but on the other hand, when you're playing a game in a tournament, that you don't know the degree of difficulty either. So you could certainly argue for either one. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. I think kind of both are, are both nice, depending on what mood you're in. <laughs> that uh, presented uh, by theme or presented by difficulty versus just thrown in the deep end. Uh, yeah, it just kind of depends what mood you're in. Yeah, but I mean, both are fantastic books. Any other differences that you would highlight, Michael? Um, I, I really like how in both books, um, Mickey Adams' solution is more than just a solution. It's also usually like an explanation of the rest of the game. So unfortunately, uh, often the rest of the game is kind of like a blitz game that Philip Rotato played uh, online. So it's not, it doesn't have the same gravitas as, you know, right. Geller, Geller versus someone. <laughs> but um, yeah, I really like uh, how he kind of makes it more than just, oh yeah, that puzzle, you solved it. Great job. That's the end of the story. No, no, no. It's actually, here's the rest of the game and here's some grandmaster annotations that can help you understand why maybe what was played in the game was inaccurate versus what would have been best played was much more interesting. Um, yeah, so I mean... He has one puzzle that's like black or white. Uh, Bricard does. It's like black or white to move and win. And then the solution is literally like 50 moves, um, you know, which it's not, you know, it doesn't totally invalidate the claim of it being X to move and win because it's the slow process of nursing an advantage. And if you give it an engine, they would say that that side has a decisive advantage. But it's just very different from how uh, most chess books would present a puzzle of that nature. 
Right, right. And there's and no that's apology also, for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's part that's cooked into it. Um, yeah, that's that's one quibble I would actually have with both books. Um, if you compare it to, for instance, uh, the Woodpecker Method, right? In that book, they are very tactical by definition, but they also have check marks that say, this is what you actually needed to see. Now, technically, the solution is going to be longer than that because it's interesting to kind of see how the game continues. But once you've gotten to the, you know, deep enough in the variation where you get the check mark, that's actually what the author is expecting you to kind of see going into it. So in Think Like a Super GM, there is no check mark system, but there's a suite of other players who solved the puzzle and you can kind of see from their thoughts, oh, this is probably what I should have been able to calculate. Yeah. Whereas in the Bricard book, there is no check mark. There is no, this is what a person live is thinking about it. And basically it's just a blend from the solution to the exercise to here's the rest of the whole game. There's no actual delineation. Yeah, well said. Um, so before we go, two things on the agenda. I'd like to give a few recommendations for people looking for something of a similar bent, but for um, easier entry level. Um, and Michael, catch up on your own uh, chess studies briefly. But is there anything you would want to add about these particular books before we move on to those topics? I really enjoyed both of them. I have to say that Rickard, uh, this book just seems to be the perfect book for me when I needed it. So I'm really partial to this book just being great. Um, it is not easy, but I feel like, uh, in my opinion, based on the conclusions of Think Like a Super GM as well, it's like going through these problems and doing them with maximum effort is how you improve a chess. That's like yeah. the fundamental, true, this is what it takes. <laughs> I, I can't disagree with you. And that's probably why I slightly prefer Think Like a Super GM because I'm I'm lazy and old and you're young and ambitious. <laughs> and there you go. It shows. <laughs> but uh they're both they're both fantastic books. I agree. Uh, okay. Um so for lower rated players, there's not that much out there, in my opinion, um, of books that I mean, would fit the general criteria of being no theme presented, uh, maybe a positional orientation. I mean, I do have some suggestions, but Michael, I didn't prompt you for this, but does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, I, I've got some alternatives as well. Um, I feel like, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Eugene Perlstein and Nate Solon's book, Evaluate Like a GM, is kind of similar, although much more accessible than both of these books and also not... Um, they don't ask too much of you. They're really looking for the bare minimum uh, as a solution. And the solution that they write up is also very sparse. And then um, I would also say, uh, well, maybe it's contentious, but Jeremy Silman's Reassess Your Chest, the workbook um, is also kind of similar in uh, to these two and also significantly more accessible, probably if you're 1200 or maybe 1500 is like the maximum you need to be to really get most of those. Yeah, I, I had highlighted that book by Selman as well. He's very good at uh, explaining ideas. To, so um, I, I think that's a good choice if you're lower rated. Um, and, and beyond that, it's it's hard to come up with. There are books that are good positional guides. Of course, these these have been discussed in previous podcasts and book recap podcasts. You know, Neil Bruce loves The the Power of Pawns. There's a, a, a so that's say 13 to 1500 level. There's Simple Chess slightly above that. There's Mastering Chess Strategy by Halston, which I consider a more entry level, uh, challenging material, but again, very good explanations. Um, so those are those are some suggestions as well. Um, and there's positional primers for people, say, 11, 1200, like Yasser's Winning Chess Strategy, which is not my personal number one, but it's solid. But yeah, in terms of uh, actual puzzle books, there's not a ton out there, but uh, definitely echo your, your recommendation of Evaluate Liquor Grandmaster as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. That's another thing that makes me like both of these books even more is because I feel like there's definitely um, an audience for people that want these strategy positions and not just purely tactical. And while I think like a super GM, maybe half of them kind of ended up being tactics uh, at the end of the day, they're still uh, a lot of positional stuff to consider. And just the problem selection from both of these books really makes it uh, worthwhile to really go through. Yeah, I agree. And one other thing is I've noticed that there's there's a an appetite for that from lower rated club players. But one one bit of advice I, I would give to them is you 
you want to focus more on the micro of your own games in, in that situation. It's nice to be presented with these Grandmaster games and be shown sort of the typical plans. But if you can work from your own opening structures and start with that, it's kind of like a more um, accessible way and possibly more practical way to begin to understand uh, typical plans rather than to, to grab for um, a more general uh, positional guidebook type book that might be um, a a slightly challenging for you. Yeah. And especially if, like I mentioned before, if you're an E45 player and a lot of the positions are in, you know, D4, D5, and you never play that from black and you don't play that from white, then you're going to have less positional understanding. And it also might not be that useful to you right now. So I yeah. totally agree. And of course, it can be a challenge, especially if you don't have a coach like to to necessarily figure that out. But uh, at least going deeper on your openings. And obviously, in that case, even without a coach, uh, whether you're watching videos or reading books, so you can find material that helps helps you learn the plans and and practice executing them. But I think a lot of the desire is just because we all ultimately come to this feeling in chess of you're playing a game and you feel like you have no idea what to do. Um, and it's it's discomforting, but that that's kind of there's always going to be situations where that's the case. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> um, so in closing, Michael, um, so you you did a long interview recently with um, Kevin Skoll. So again, there's not too much uh, to discuss. But for one thing, do you have any tournaments coming up? I know you're a busy guy with uh, your work and your puppy. Yeah, the puppy is a real time sink, actually. <laughs> so. <laughs> Now I understand what uh, people were talking about when they say uh, your the peak rating that you'll reach is when you get your your first kid. <laughs> when you have your first puppy, right? But yeah, your first puppy is not quite that same level, but it's uh, yeah, it's been tough. Uh, no, I I actually don't have any plans for OTB right now. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of the year, uh, things will get much more stable at home, and and then I'll be able to kind of sign up again. Uh, but it's it's like a partial uh, halftime job, just keeping up with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Are you still managing to uh, to crack some chess books and do some studying? Yeah. So um, I finished Think Like a Super GM uh, since having him. And uh, I've next up on the docket is uh, Shanklin's book, Small Small Steps to, to Giant Improvement. So, you know, still going through some books, uh, finishing up the Woodpecker Advanced Problems also. That's a, a slog as well. But it kind of continues the... Uh, conversation we've had which is like well how do you get better at chess you gotta calculate yeah. <laughs> you gotta work on your visualization so hopefully uh hopefully those two are, are going to be good enough to take me through at the end of the year yeah i mean it seems i'm i'm always impressed with like how much time how many books you're managing to read if nothing else <laughs> yeah maybe too much books and not enough playing but okay that's what i have time for <laughs> Yeah. And, and uh, you know, to some extent, you also have to do what you enjoy and clearly uh, you, you enjoy it. And, and we appreciate that you're you're then in turn able to come and uh, share your insights uh, with all of us. Yeah. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, so knows knows all on Lee Chess. That's pretty much all people need to know. Oh, and, and Chess Dojo. That's pretty much all people need to know. Right, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. If someone wants to message me, definitely just hit me up on uh, send me a private message on Lee Chess and I'll, I'll get it probably within a day. Okay. And of course, the again, uh, strategic chess exercises is available on Chessable, but uh, are you going to make the uh, Lee Chess study you did? Is that going to be publicly available or uh, are you going to keep it for yourself? Um, I, I thought about that. I feel like maybe Brickard wouldn't want me to do that because I have basically all of his annotations in there. So I figured okay. <laughs> I Let's think that's private. yeah, I think that's the right thing to do. It's always a, a tricky subject because I do love, like, for example, Bobby Fisher's 60 memorable games. It kind of, you know, go through a book like that, it's kind of annoying that, that I'm not aware of a um I'm not aware of it being available on like an ebook, you know, like it's in Kindle, but I'm not aware of it being on Forward Chess or New In Chess Reader or anything like that. Um but of course there are Lee Chess studies with all the games, but they don't have all the annotations. So presumably anyone who's going through it has bought the book, which is what we want. But yeah, yeah. with with what you describe, it's um it's um tenuous. And on Chessable again, it's only 25 bucks. And on Kindle, I think it's probably 10 or 15. So um yeah. hopefully affordable for most people. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh I feel like the benefit of Think Like a Super GM is a lot more than just the puzzles. So maybe that one I can make public because the puzzles don't really show everything. The book is so much more. Um, but yeah, the strategic chess exercises one, it's it's really all about you know, the puzzles and his explanations and his solutions. And if I've kind of 
somehow I didn't, but if I had written everything that he's written in the Leisha study, it seems a little bit wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. So we will link to anything discussed as always. And yeah, Michael, thanks for, thanks for volunteering. Um, I don't know when my next uh, book recap will be, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't, shouldn't be more than two months at least. I certainly have had some people reach out. Uh, there is a form that if you're interested in being a guest co-host to discuss a book, um, I have no shortage of volunteers, but, but, uh, I, what I have a shortage of is time, <laughs> but, uh, feel free to reach out if anyone's interested because, uh, these will be continuing, um, at a slight slower pace than they used to, but continuing nonetheless. But uh, but thanks again, Michael. Really appreciate it. One one last question, actually. Uh, when is your book coming out, actually? Because that's another one that maybe I'd finish before the end oh, of the year. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So you caught me at a um, record sort of busy week. So we're recording on Monday, September 18th. It's supposed to go to print in two days. So I've been frantically rereading, looking for edits, and it's still supposed to be available November 1st uh, here in the US, it's going to be on like, it's going to be on Kindle, it's going to be on the new in chess reader, I think it's going to be on forward chess as well. I'm also doing an audio book. So it's gonna be very hard to avoid this book. That's my plan, at least. Okay. Um, so and and the other thing is, because I've been frantically rereading it, I will say that, I mean, it's like 15 20% chess, it's mostly sort of compiled wisdom. So I think, uh, even for a busy person, like it, it, it won't be super stressful to read. That's the plan, at least. Yeah, yeah, then definitely looking forward to getting that one. And, and I can add that one to my list to, to finish by the end of the year. Well. Plus, you're in it, so you got to get it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again, Michael. And thanks to everyone still listening. And we will catch you all soon. <laughs>